Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Hey, would you uh, extend a hand? Mike's going to teach today, and I'd love to pray for him. Lord, we just thank you for, uh, for the gift that Mike is. And uh, Lord, we just ask that um, your anointing would be upon him today, that your Holy Spirit would uh, speak through him. And God, we just thank you that um, you've got a word, a timely word for us. And uh, we ask God that you'd encourage Mike and bless him today as he's faithful to you in your name. Amen. Amen. Did you say timely or tiny word? I can, both? Got it. Hey, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off last week. If you were with us last week, Monica was reading from Ephesians 2. We were talking about the church as a body. So we're going to be in Ephesians 2 again, but looking at a different image for the church. So if you have a Bible with you, you can open to Ephesians. It's a tiny book toward the back. So if you're around things called Romans or Corinthians, keep going a little bit. If you're in Revelation, you can't go any further. You got to turn around, go back. So So Ephesians 2, uh, we've been in a series looking at uh, the various ways the church is described in the Bible. So we've been looking at the images of the church as a body, the church as a bride, the church as a family, the church as a flock. And today, uh, we're going to be looking at the church as a building, the church as a building. So I'm going to read from Ephesians 2. I'm going to start in verse 18 and go through 22. So this is just a segue. There's been so much talked about the work of Christ and what he's accomplished for us and brought us into a family and a household. So it says in verse 18, for through him, that's Jesus, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So pastors for a long time have been telling us the church is not a building, right? That you don't go to church, you are the church, right? If you've heard this before, the church is not a building, you are the church. So I don't want to undo all their hard work or confuse anybody. Yes, we, the people of God, are the church, but we are described as a building. There's an image given that we are a structure that God built, and this is to communicate how strategic God is, how intentional he is. You You don't accidentally build a building, right? You can accidentally get married, or accidentally start a family, or accidentally find some sheep, and create a flock. I don't know. I've never done that before, but... um, to build, you got to be purposeful. You got to be intentional. The only way you're going to accomplish building is to be strategic, and God is strategic. So I love all the beautiful images we've looked at so far, communicating how God's a father, he's a shepherd, he's, uh, he's the head, all these great things. But today we get the kind of the 40,000 foot view of the church, and we get to see that God's, the church is God's plan A. The church is God's plan A for accomplishing the daunting task of making disciples of all people groups on the earth. That's the task given to the church. And it is borderline impossible when you think about it. And to have a plan that daunting, God certainly must be strategic. He must be an architect that is carefully building and shaping the church into uh, something that will bring glory to him and bless the earth. So I learned uh, fairly early on in my parenting t- career that it was not good for me to play Legos with my kids. Um, I have five children. Um, it's a lot. It's okay. You can say that. Um, four sons and a daughter, and which means I, I step on Legos like seven times a day. At least, I stepped on one this morning, actually. I could not figure out why is there a Lego man in front of my sock drawer at 5 a.m.? But it's my life. So 
I step on Legos often. All my kids loving build, building Legos, even to the two-year-old Theo gets involved. And trying to be a good dad, I would sometimes park myself at their Lego table to kind of get in the mix and play Legos with them. Uh, by now, my older boys have far surpassed me in Lego architectural skills. But in the early days, what, turned, what started as me trying to be a good dad and get quality time with the kids ended up Hap what ended up happening is me biting my tongue the whole time, trying not to correct their every move because their 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 structures were you know unsound. The um, <laughs> the walls were clearly not tall enough to house a, a legitimate Lego man army. They didn't. They were le leaving out key pieces. They did not follow the directions. In fact, they would they would build the thing once and then throw away the directions and dump that brand new $60 box of Legos into this massive pile that resides under their bed. And so I learned I should stop playing Legos with them. They, we have different goals. My kids, my kids want to have fun when they play Legos. I want to be right when you play Legos. Um, so thankfully, God is a much more patient father and builder than I am. He is good at meeting us at our level. He's entrusted us with this beautiful, complex, strategic, living organism called the church that's designed to reach the whole world with the good news of Jesus. And boy, do we mess it up sometimes. We're leaving out key pieces. We spend too much time on this and not enough time on that. I'm sure it's frustrating to God to watch how we build the, with this thing that he's given us. But thankfully, he is a patient and loving builder and a good father. And over all these thousands of years, he hasn't thrown in the towel. He hasn't given up on us. He is still actively building us, the people of God, into the structure that he envisions and is patiently doing his work through us. So buildings are not a New Testament thing. Buildings are all throughout Scripture. In fact, um, you could say that the whole Old Testament is like a narrative leading up to the building of the temple. Like it's a really big deal. And temples in ancient times were super important because they were this space for meeting with the divine, right? These aren't just like temp all kinds of religions would build these spaces to meet with the divine. Uh, but in the scriptures, we see God creating Adam and Eve, and there's no temple because he walks with them and meets with them face to face. There's no temple space that is needed, but that ends rather quickly. Like It's like three chapters into the Bible that ends, sin and the fall happen, and people are cast away from God's presence. And so the, the narrative arc of the Old Testament is that God first finds a family, Abraham and his descendants, to meet with, and then later that turns into a nation, and his glory begins to return in tents and manifestations of his presence in the wilderness. And all this is leading up to when David, King David, brings in the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, and David realizes this is a big deal. God's presence is back with us. We should build a structure to hold this wonderful thing. And as it goes, David's son Solomon is the one who accomplishes the task, builds the temple, and it's amazing. God is with us. God's presence is with his people in a permanent geographical location, and it is really exciting. Fast forward 500 years, the unthinkable happens, the temple is destroyed by the Babylonians, and we start thinking, well, perhaps the point wasn't the temple. Maybe the, this is pointing to something else, and as Christians, we look back on that, and we view it through the lens of Christ, and we see that Jesus, in Matthew 12, shows up and says, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. In fact, Jesus was called, one of his names was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. John, in chapter 2, uh, John 2 to 21, says the temple that Jesus was speaking of was his body. So Jesus is a breathing, walking, speaking, living temple, a place to meet with God where people can meet with the divine. That's what's going on. And then Jesus dies for our sins, rises again to power, ascends back into heaven, and we're faced with a big problem. Those, those of us that are designed for it to be with God's presence are there's no temple. If he was the living, breathing, walking temple of God, now he's gone. What happens? What happens now? Well, the answer to that question is really the crux of our messages this week and next week, where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? Yikes. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a little twist in the story. 
right? We can kind of get our heads around, yeah, Jesus, that makes sense that Jesus would be the temple. He's perfect. He's awesome. You know, but now Jesus ascends and we're told that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' physical absence, the church has been given this immense privilege of being the temple of the Holy Spirit, the place where people can meet with God. Not a physical building anymore. Not that lot or this tent, right? We can move all over the place and we remain the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not a physical geographical location anymore. It's different than the Old Testament. We are the building. Just as Jesus was the breathing, living, walking, speaking temple of God, we, his followers, are now the breathing, living, walking, speaking temple of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you could, if you think about it, This would mean that if an unbeliever, somebody who doesn't know God, is interested, I want to find God, I want to meet with God, they shouldn't go to a building anymore. Where should they go? To us. Yikes. If that doesn't freak you out, I don't know what will, right? I mean, that's what that God is saying. When people need to meet with me, I want them to go to you, the church, the building of God. So, which brings us back to Ephesians 2. So, buildings have purposes, right? You, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a contractor or an engineer, not even close. But I imagine that the purpose of a building affects how you design and build it. Just taking a wild guess here. That you don't design and build houses in the same way that you design and build 1.3 million square foot Amazon fulfillment centers out on Riggin Avenue. They're built differently, Right? Because their purpose is different. So uh, in Ephesians 2, we get a picture of how the church is built and why the church is built. What the purpose of the church. So uh, it says, again, we're citizens. We're brought into the household of God. Verse 20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So as you can see, attention is paid to the foundation of the church, of the structure, but also its epic, large-scale purpose. So the big purpose of us getting together this morning and being the church, there's a big purpose. It's not just because we don't have anything to do on a Sunday. There's a big purpose. And eschatologically, meaning like with the end in mind, where this is all heading The purpose of the church is to be God's holy habitation on earth until the return of Jesus. We're to be that that place. Again, not a physical, specific location, but the people of God joined together are meant to inhabit uh, the, the glory and the presence of God. That's the big purpose. Did you wake up this morning thinking that? Like, I better get there. I gotta, I'm the holy habitation of God, right? I mean, it's, it changes things. You're not just here filling a seat this is not, you know, when we, when we get together, it matters. Maybe you've never been to church, or maybe you've been to quieter churches, and you got here this morning, you're like, why are they so loud? Why so much clapping, right? I mean, that's what we're getting at today. When we place our confidence in Christ, we get loud. We get excited because this is a big deal that God is doing. His presence with us is exciting, and, and, and it matters. So that's the big purpose of the church. Structurally, how it's built It says that it's built upon Christ, and it says that the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, which might have you kind of curious, what does that mean? So we're going to look at that. First, again, the purpose of the church. We're to be a temple of the Holy Spirit. In 2 Chronicles 7, we see this very explicitly. When Solomon finished praying over the temple, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord. Now, it may not always look this dramatic, right? But the purpose of the church as the temple is to be the host of the glory of God, to literally house the holiest of holies. Like God's very presence should, should be felt here experienced here as we gather as his people. That's incredible. I mean, that would be a great Sunday if God's presence was so, so thick, the pastors couldn't do their job, right? It's just like God's glory is so evident, the priest couldn't get in. And it was just God's glory and his presence was filling the temple. 
That's a really cool purpose. But how is it built? How do we get there? Well, first and most importantly, Jesus is the cornerstone. That's what it says in Ephesians. He's the, the chief cornerstone. He himself. We've lost a sense of what a cornerstone is because now they're just like a photo op at buildings, right? When we build a building, it's like we put this cute stone there in the corner. There's the cornerstone, even though it means nothing for the structure, the, the building anymore, because things are built differently than in ancient times. But back then, the cornerstone was significant. It was typically larger than the other stones. It uh, would help control the design and make everything symmetrical. And if the cornerstone was off, that wasn't a good thing. And I hope I don't have to explain this, but the cornerstone got its name because of where it was placed on the building. Any guesses? The corner, right, where these walls come together, where there's a lot of weight put on. The cornerstone was super, super important. Christ, then, is the cornerstone of the church, meaning that everything rests on him here. His work, his person, the work on the cross, his resurrection, that's the only adequate and stable foundation for this temple of the Holy Spirit that God is building. Christ is the cornerstone. And it would be good for us to remember that when things are so chaotic and divisive right now in the world to know that Christ is a cornerstone because the world is really aware of my faults, your faults, the church as a whole, the faults that we have. So it'd be good for us to remind ourselves and to point them to the stable, adequate foundation of Christ. That's what, that, that is the most important part of the building, the cornerstone that is being, uh, this church is being built on. Jesus in Matthew 16 said, asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And to this confession, Jesus replies to Peter. He says, blessed are you, Simon. That was Peter's first name. Son of Jonah, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by, by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. Peter means rock. He says, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. So as soon as Peter declares Christ's identity, Jesus starts talking about rocks and foundations and an overcoming church. Christ himself, the son of the living God, is forever the solid rock. And when we recognize that, it's a really good thing. Just like Peter said, like that hymn says, everything else is shifting sand. Christ is a solid rock. The person, the work of Jesus is the immovable cornerstone. But Ephesians also says that it's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. So I think the Michael Dusing, this theologian, sums it up well. I think he, he says it well. He says, perhaps what this means is that these early leaders were uniquely used by the Lord to establish and undergird the temple of the Spirit with the teachings and practices that they had learned from Christ, which continue to be communicated to believers today through the Scriptures. John Stott says, since apostles and prophets were both groups with a teaching role in the church, that's what the apostles and prophets would do, it seems clear that what constitutes the church's foundation is neither their person, so it's not Peter himself or James, that's not necessarily what the, we're getting at here, it's not their person or their office or the, like the role they filled, but their instruction. So it's the teaching they've handed down to us because they were the ones that were with Christ. So if we're going to build on the foundation of Christ it would benefit us to learn from the ones that walked with Christ through the scriptures. And this is the kind of building that will happen until Jesus returns. So how do we respond to this? How do we respond to a message about architecture? I mean, uh, I think Jesus, if we look at his parable in Matthew 21, I think provides an interesting response for us today. You can read it later, Matthew 21, 33 through 34. He tells a story about a vineyard owner who hires tenants to take care of his vineyard. And then later he sends for messengers to collect the fruit that was produced. But those tenants end up killing every messenger that is sent, including the son of the vineyard owner that is sent. Kills them. And the people listening to Jesus are incensed. They're angry at this. Like, how, how justice, kill those, those tenants. And Jesus tells them, have you not read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Anyone who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. Jesus is quoting Psalm 118 there, this rejected cornerstone. 
And looking back, we see that it was him because those same people that were listening to him teach this wonderful teaching would later be calling for his execution, demanding that he be killed, rejecting him, this person that was meant to be the cornerstone they're rejecting. And the plot twist in the story of Jesus is that this rejected cornerstone is in fact the most perfect, true cornerstone there is. The very man that they attempted to discard like a useless stone, like just another block in the building, was the most important man of all. The Messiah, the living, breathing, walking, speaking temple of the Holy Spirit is rejected. And Jesus says that, Anyone who falls on this stone will be crushed or will be broken to pieces. Either one of those images is not good. Those are not good outcomes, right? To be crushed or broken. They're terrifying pictures of judgment. What happens when we reject Christ? There is judgment. But there's another option that we see in the life of Peter or Mary Magdalene, people who come to him humbly and repent and fall down at his feet and worship him. Psalm 34 says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. So you don't have an option. I don't have an option. Brokenness and crushing is going to happen in our life. And we can either pridefully build our lives on our own foundation and end up falling and being crushed to pieces that one day when we encounter that chief cornerstone and realize, oh, my life was worthless. My life was worthless and we're crushed in judgment. Or like Psalm 34 says, we can come to him with our brokenness. We're crushed in spirit. Like Mary and Peter and many other people came to Jesus crushed and saying, save me, save me. And he doesn't come to us in judgment. He comes to us. He comes near us and heals us and forgives us in mercy then these realities of this structure being built together for the glory of God becomes personal for you and me. Christ becomes our actual cornerstone. When everything else is going crazy in life, we feel more stable and steady. And we take our place in this lovely temple of God's Holy Spirit and 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 we're built together for the glory of God and to house His Holy Spirit. This is God's plan A for revealing His glory on the earth and shaping people into the image of Christ. Not that we would be perfect people that put out an image of perfection and build our lives on all kinds of other foundations. No, plan A is that we fall on the mercy of God now and say, oh, I need you, God. I need you today. Every hour, I need you. Every hour, I need you. You are the only cornerstone, Jesus. So we're going to respond to this in worship. Maybe the worship team could come back up wherever they're at. And could you stand with us? We're going to have a time of singing. Um, If you do have a a little one over in the kids' building, building? I just preached a whole sermon on buildings, and now I say building. All right. Fantastic. Um, (laughs) If you have a little one over in the kids building, you can go grab them and bring them back over and and join us. We're going to sing. I had this image as we were praying um, before church this morning of Jesus on the cross. If you've read the story in the Bible, he's crucified between two thieves, two people that deserved it on on either side of him. And here this perfect cornerstone has been rejected who doesn't deserve it is being is taking on a penalty of of a sinner. And people are mocking Jesus, telling him, hey, if you are the son of God, if you are that cornerstone, save yourself. Save yourself. And then one of the thieves next to Jesus, his eyes are open, his spiritual eyes are open, he gets it. He realizes this guy doesn't deserve it. I deserve it. And he just simply says, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. At the end of his life, he gets it. He realizes I've been building my life on another foundation. Now I see it. Christ, you're the way. And Jesus replies to him, I I tell you today, you'll be with me in paradise. You will be with me in paradise. We have a savior who refused to save himself so that we could be saved, so that we could be rescued. And if you've been building your life on another foundation, there is a place today for you to return to Christ. He won't make you make up for it. He won't make you pay for it. He'll receive you 
in mercy and grace and forgiveness to build your life to the glory of God. He's the only foundation. So Jesus, we turn to you in faith. Lord, it's difficult. This world is crazy, and we're just clinging to anything that feels stable at the moment. But we turn our hearts to you in faith, Jesus. We say you're the way, you're the truth, you're the life. All other ground is sinking sand, Jesus. You are the firm foundation. Would you build us as individuals on the firm foundation of Christ, your finished work? Would you build this church on the firm foundation of the finished work? We turn to you, Jesus, today. Amen. Hey, let's worship him. There's space today. Get to God today. Give him your heart. Doesn't matter the week you've had, the year you've had, turn to him. Turn to him. Say, I need you, Jesus. And he will build your life on a firm foundation. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. Ah